Hello! A while back, I released a video on my channel about a very unusual liquid called dry water. Now, there's no way to soak a piece of paper with it or destroy your computer with it by submerging it, but one viewer even left a comment below that video and it said, What's next? Solid air? Well, I did manage to get dry water, so maybe I could also get solid air. Hmm. Why don't we see what we can do? I think you all know that different substances on Earth can have four states of matter. Solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. For example, the most vital substance on Earth, water, has three states of matter. It can be ice, liquid, or vapor, depending on the temperature. Now, let's think about a metal, like aluminum. As we all know, it has a solid state at room temperature, but it changes from a solid to a liquid at 660 degrees Celsius. Next, the thin aluminum foil placed in the microwave oven will begin to vaporize partially under the influence of high-frequency radiation. The resulting aluminum vapor will become even hotter and turn into a plasma with a temperature exceeding tens of thousands of degrees Celsius. Even a beaker made of heat-resistant borosilicate glass can easily crack because of the sharp temperature drop. Okay, everything's pretty simple with aluminum, but what about other substances, which we all used to see only in one state of matter? Let's consider the air. It consists of a mix of gases such as nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide. I think only a few of you have seen it in a state that is other than gas. And it's no wonder because the gases making up air aren't supposed to change their state into liquid or solid at all under normal conditions on Earth. Of course, we can find liquid and solid nitrogen as well as oxygen or even metallic hydrogen somewhere in the depth of Jupiter, the gas giant, because of specific temperature and pressure conditions. But could these be replicated here on our home planet of Earth? The problem is that to transform some gases into a liquid state, it's necessary to either extremely lower the temperature or very high pressure. For instance, to liquefy a gas like butane, which you can find in any lighter, a pressure of only two atmospheres is enough. If butane is poured from a cylinder into a test tube at one atmosphere, the temperature will drop to the boiling point of butane, minus one degree Celsius. It'll be able to stay in a liquid state for a long time. If the ambient temperature stays at this low temperature, it'll be able to remain in a liquid state for a long time. This is why some lighters just don't work when it's freezing outside. The butane inside just doesn't vaporize, it remains liquid. Its states of matter can be easily determined with the phase diagram, which illustrates the variations between the states as it relates to pressure and temperature. And for that same reason, the lighters must not be stored at a temperature above 50 degrees Celsius, otherwise the butane will start vaporizing even more actively and create pressure above four atmospheres, and the lighter case won't withstand that pressure and it'll crack or a safety valve will blow off. And there are phase diagrams for other gases besides butane. They're not always so similar. For example, carbon dioxide can't be liquid at any atmospheric pressure. It remains solid, which is why it's also called dry ice. Carbon dioxide can only be liquefied at a pressure of 70 atmospheres, like in this sealed ampule, which can withstand that high pressure. But carbon dioxide doesn't last long in this state. As soon as the ampule is heated up to 31 degrees Celsius, the liquid carbon dioxide is going to get into a supercritical state, where distinct liquid and gas phases don't exist. It's called a supercritical fluid. When the temperature is lowered, the supercritical fluid condenses back into a liquid. It looks pretty impressive. Believe me, the physics of gases may often be rather bizarre and strange. The question is, what happens to air at high pressure? Does it become a liquid? If we take a look at the phase diagram of nitrogen, which makes up most of the air, we can see that it turns into a liquid only at a temperature of minus 140 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 34 atmospheres. Oxygen and argon, which also make up the air, have similar properties. So it means that no matter how much we compress the air, it doesn't turn into a liquid, even in Antarctica at minus 80 degrees Celsius. But you might ask, how so when there are so many videos about obtaining liquid nitrogen? There's a technique in physics known as adiabatic cooling to make this happen. For example, if we start pumping air into a champagne bottle under pressure, 
it'll start heating slightly, as the increase in pressure causes the temperature of the air to rise as well. If the plug blows off during the process, the pressure drops significantly, and so will the air temperature, and even some of the water vapor may condense in the bottle. This very effect is known as adiabatic cooling. It's a process of reducing the heat through a change in the pressure. So for instance, we can first pump air free of moisture and dust into cylinders at a pressure of 200 atmospheres, then cool it to dissipate the resulting heat from the pressure rise. After that, if the gas pressure is drastically reduced, it can cool so much that it passes the dew point and becomes liquid. It's the very property that's used in industrial technologies for air liquefaction. This is how liquid air is produced on an industrial scale using rectification, and after that, it's separated into its components like nitrogen, oxygen, and other gases since they all have different boiling points. To put it simply, air can be distilled like moonshine and get its components, but liquid air isn't sold like that because it contains undesirable impurities like oxygen and other gases. So typically, we can buy only liquid nitrogen, which comes in Dewar flasks that are analogous to big thermo flasks that you may see elsewhere. The boiling point of liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees Celsius, which is the lowest boiling point of all the components of air. So other gases can be converted into liquid or even solid states with its help like butane can be frozen into liquid nitrogen. I filled a test tube with butane and placed it in a thermo flask with liquid nitrogen. Since butane freezes at just below minus 140 degrees Celsius, it'll take some time to solidify. After about 15 minutes, the butane had completely solidified. So I topped it into an evaporating dish. It's interesting that because of the very high difference between the boiling and freezing points, Butane ice actually melts really quickly, forming a very cold puddle of liquid butane. It's pretty rare to see this unusual states of matter of gas from ordinary lighters. Besides butane, another component of air can be frozen, specifically argon. But pure argon is pretty expensive and hard to get, so I went to the lab. To freeze argon, we filled a small thermoflask with a small amount of liquid nitrogen then put a test tube into it that was connected to an argon line. In case you didn't know, laboratories often have an entire argon pipeline to create an inert atmosphere. Along this pipeline, argon is delivered into different apparatus and extraction hoods, creating an inert atmosphere inside of them. And because of this, almost no substance can oxidize and interfere with the planned reaction process. Finally, after about 10 minutes, a small amount of solid argon has already accumulated in the test tube. The freezing point of argon is 7 degrees higher than the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. Nothing comes out. We did it! Catch it! Catch it! Here's our do-over. Just doesn't want to pop out. It did! Didn't it? Catch it! Okay, here it is. After several attempts, we managed to get a small argon ice cube. It instantly began to melt and vaporize on the table because the boiling point of argon is only 4 degrees higher than the freezing point. So it hardly has time to melt before as it immediately evaporates under normal room conditions. Now you know how to turn some components of air into liquid or even a solid state. But how do you make the solid air? How do you make solid nitrogen, oxygen, and argon at the same time? Well, it's pretty easy to convert nitrogen into a solid state. There's another technique in physics known as Raoult's Law. To demonstrate how this law works, first, we need to assemble a small vacuum setup consisting of a vacuum pump and a fairly sturdy desiccator capable of withstanding reduced pressure. Let's see what we can come up with. First, I poured some room temperature tap water into a small plastic beaker. Then placed it into the desiccator. And then I turned on the vacuum pump to create a reduced pressure inside it. Once the pressure drops below atmospheric pressure, the boiling point of the water also begins to drop. Upon reaching the pressure that is 4% atmospheric pressure, the water begins to boil even at room temperature and cool at the same time, because boiling consumes its thermal energy. If we keep pumping the gas out of the desiccator, the boiling water can cool so much that it may even freeze. The same will happen with the other substances, including... I need to do the same to get solid nitrogen. 
I pour some liquid nitrogen into the same plastic beaker. We have to wait until it cools the beaker walls and stops boiling so vigorously. After turning on the vacuum pump, nitrogen starts boiling slightly, just like water. And along with that, its temperature begins to lower gradually. Once the temperature of liquid nitrogen reaches minus 210 degrees, nitrogen ice forms on the surface of the liquid, which can melt at the slightest fluctuation in temperature or pressure. If the vacuum in the desiccator is maintained long enough, a sufficient amount of liquid nitrogen can be frozen. Looks a little weird. After turning off the vacuum pump because of an imperfect seal, some air leaks into the desiccator, making the nitrogen ice melt slightly because of the change in pressure. Finally, I managed to make solid at least one component of air, nitrogen. It's time to give it a try and make solid air in the same way. But first, I need to convert it to a liquid. It's pretty easy to get liquid air. I pour some liquid nitrogen into a titanium pot, which begins to cool very quickly as the nitrogen boils in it. Titanium has a low thermal conductivity, so the part of the pot that contains the liquid nitrogen cools down to a temperature of minus 196 Celsius. This causes the air gases to condense on its surface. So that cloudy liquid that begins to drip from the pot is not water droplets, but it's droplets of liquid air. Now we're onto something. Since air is made up of approximately 21% oxygen, which has a boiling point of 13 degrees higher than liquid nitrogen, it condenses first on the titanium pot, along with argon, water vapor, and nitrogen from the air. The large amount of oxygen in the liquid air makes its trickle attract to the magnet, just like the very droplets of this cold liquid. In addition to its magnetic properties, liquid air also easily oxidizes any flammable objects. For instance, burning a rushlight in a beaker with liquid air burns like rocket fuel. Before turning liquid air into a solid, I decided to filter it from water crystals and other gases. And a regular coffee filter actually does this job just fine. Because of its superfluidity, liquid air easily passes through a filter that traps all impurities. As a result, we get a very cold but still clear and bluish liquid because of the liquid oxygen content. And as last time, I cover the desiccator with a lid, then start pumping air out of an improvised vacuum chamber. However, unlike liquid nitrogen, liquid air does not begin to boil when the pressure decreases, which is rather strange. After half an hour of work, the vacuum pump started to overheat and release a large quantity of vacuum oil, but liquid air wasn't freezing. What's wrong? It turns out that because of the presence of liquid oxygen in the composition of liquid air, its triple point, meaning the state at which it begins to freeze, starts only at an incredibly low pressure, which has to be a hundred times lower than for the freezing of liquid nitrogen. Such a low pressure can only be achieved in extremely expensive vacuum setups, costing millions of dollars, which of course uh, I don't have. So I'll have to get some solid air some other way. Maybe I could use the coldest liquid in the world, liquid helium. Turns out that today, unlike liquid nitrogen, which is sold in many cities, getting liquid helium is not very easy. It's often sold in huge Dewar containers of 100 liters minimum, and it can cost $30 per liter. But I was lucky, and I got one company that allowed me to conduct experiments with liquid helium and show you how to make solid air. As before, we start by obtaining some liquid air and filtering out the water crystal impurities. After all this, we got this slightly magnetic and cold liquid. Next, we filled a transparent Dewar flask with some liquid helium, which is pumped from a big Dewar flask with the help of a regular helium from a cylinder. This temperature of the liquid helium coming out of the tube is minus 269 degrees. It's 73 degrees lower than the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. This low temperature immediately produces a very dense fog from the air. It consists not only of water, but also of small drops of liquid air, which immediately evaporate and rise up along with evaporating helium. It looks really weird, especially taking into account the fact that the temperature here is just five degrees above absolute zero.
To freeze what we breathe, I filled a test tube with liquid air and waited for it to stop boiling so much so it could cool the walls of the test tube. And when I brought a magnet close, the test tube started getting slightly attracted to it. This indicates that the concentration of liquid oxygen in the test tube is at least 50%. The last thing to be done is to place it in a Dewar flask with liquid helium and wait for the air to solidify. Its melting point is about minus 220 degrees, about 46 degrees higher than the boiling point of liquid helium. Excitingly, in the transparent Dewar flask, we can see that the liquid helium, along with the frozen air particles trapped in it from the test tube, is boiling and bubbling very vigorously around the test tube. Eventually, we can see that the contents of the test tube become whiter and whiter, which indicates that the air is gradually freezing. With the air solidified, I decided to check its magnetic properties again, and not much has changed as we take another look. Now we can place this solid air on the table and see how quickly it melts. It's interesting that because of the small difference between melting and boiling points, the melting air immediately vaporizes, and in a split second, it converts to the gas state we're all accustomed to. That's good for breathing. Another interesting thing is that even a melting ice cube of air gets attracted to a magnet quite well. And the melted air gets attracted to the areas of the magnet with the highest magnetic force. Besides that, after most of the helium had evaporated from the transparent Dewar flask, some solid air remained on the flask walls, which began to melt rapidly over time. It's very mesmerizing to look at, wouldn't you say? Well, I hope that after watching this video you have some more knowledge about the properties of some gases. Moreover, now you know that it is possible to get solid air even on our planet, but only in certain conditions. As always, if you liked the video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to our channel to learn more new and interesting things.